or take burns seriously because they don't the full effect doesn't come up until 48 hours after you got the initial burn because when i got back to icp they the guy was kind of thinking i was acting like a baby when i told him how bad it hurt on a scale of one to ten he asked me and i said ten and my ears looked just the same as sean's ears did and sean barely felt his ears burning and by the time they, they would wrap my head up with uh some sport bandages and stuff and had the burn packages, burn gel packages on my ears. By the time I got to the hospital in Twin Cities, it was, um, they were all bubbled out. I had blisters touching the sides of my head from the back of my ears. The injuries that I had, just my hands were second degree burns in my hands and at the time, and I didn't notice anything on my face or my ears. I didn't feel anything there, just my hands. Yeah, I, I, at the time I didn't feel anything. It was mainly when we got back to the engine and that's when I looked at Frank and we both sat next to each other. I said, you okay? I, yeah, I'm fine. It's just my, my ears hurt. And we just started, I mean, at the time it wasn't a big thing. It's just, oh, I got a sunburn on my ears and it's fine. I'm, I'm okay. Roberto's the one hurting and let's look at help him. But once you sit down and the adrenaline goes away is when we were seeing at ICP, then you start thinking, hey, my ears are hurting. My arms are hurting and my throat hurts is sore. Yeah, I had first and second degree burns to my ears, and I had burns throughout, just spotty burns on my arms just from debris going down my sleeves. After they assessed us, I, uh, I was still kind of messed up, so I remember taking my Nomex off and my clothes off, and one of my buddies asking, what are you doing? And I said, well, I don't feel burnt, so I don't know how bad I am if I'm burnt or not. So I was checking myself to see if I was burnt or not, because you know, I've, I've always been taught that you're not going to feel some of your burns. So I just wanted to make sure because nothing, nothing at that point seemed normal to me. Everything seemed a little um, unreal. Um, I kept spitting, and I'm not a spitter, I guess. I don't chew or anything like that. So one of my buddies said, what are, why are you spitting? And I really didn't realize it either why I had some issues with my, uh, my mouth from, from the heat. And so that, as long, along with some of the other guys that were having some other physical issues, they said, we're going to take you to go get checked out. And so they flew us to, uh, to Fresno to, uh, to get further checked out. They said I had some respiratory issues. They hooked me up to uh, pulmonary tests, and I think I was at like 80%. And uh, they gave me some medicine and monitored me for a couple of months. Um, my elbows were burned and my hands, for that matter, were burned by, I believe, just the radiant heat. Um, we were flown to the ambulance, taken to the hospital there in Elko. And um, they treated us as an outpatient. And they they told the they told everybody that it was just a first and second degree burn, um, that we would be fine. And they literally gave us a bottle of Vicodin and took us to the hotel room that night. Next morning, um, looking at Austin and, and his hands and face and how much they, the burns take 48, uh, 36 to 48 hours to really come to fruition. Even t uh, 12 to 15 hours after the incident, seeing what Austin looked like and what my burns were looking like, I, we, we went back to the hospital. And I was trying to convince the doctor to get us to come back to California to a burn center. So we finally got investigated that, uh, the investigation came that day and um, two days later we're on a commercial airline with uh, Austin with his face burned, his hands burned, and my elbows bandaged up and um, burned and all the you know, blood showing through on the bandages. They put us on a commercial airline and take us to uh, fly us into Bakersfield and they immediately admitted me and I spent four, four weeks in the burn center get checked out, but get to a burn center because it was, it was messed up for me it, and Chris. Like we both, they took us to the, to the hospital and we sat there, we stayed there and they let us go that, that night, like three in the morning. But I woke up the next, the next morning, that's when it swelled up. Everything, I had the blisters on my head and face and on my hands and I couldn't do nothing. So they kept us there so they could do their investigation. And, and so after that, the doctor saw us and he's like, you guys got to go home. You guys got to get home so people can help you and take care of you. So as soon as we got back, me and Chris being from two different areas, he went to one burn center, I went to the other one. I had burns, uh, the worst burns were on my face. It was kind of split like this down the side of my face all the way across here. The worst of it on the ears and you know it looked like giant cauliflower ear but it was all with you know blisters and um had a burn about the size of a baseball on my elbow 
and uh, just a few small blisters on my legs and one on my hand. We were both assigned the wound care at Regional Hospital for a while. Afterwards, they were like, you know, if this ever happens again, we're just gonna, if anybody gets any sort of burns that are serious, they're just gonna go to a burn unit, you know. Uh, it was it was tough at first. I mean, I was real timid when I came back because I, I didn't take any time off. I just came back, I think, my following shift. But I tried to keep my tough exterior, you know, like, oh, I can handle this. And the rest of that season, I was still a little bit weary of little things. Just helps you. It alerted me a lot more, paying attention just to the little things. Making, uh, should we maybe do that or shouldn't we do that or definitely gets you thinking a lot more when something like that happens. Yeah, I took a couple weeks off and uh, took the family camping and fishing and and just made sure that they were okay with what I was doing. And uh, and they said as long as, as this is still what I wanted to do, that they support it. Um, at the same time, I, I got a lot of phone calls and, and uh, visits from folks that have uh, been hurt or had uh, some pretty uh, tough situations. and, and uh, had an opportunity to talk to them about how they were dealing with their things um, years and decades after their issues and, and they were pretty uh, pretty open to talking to me and, and listening a lot of times about my issues and uh, so after I took my little vacation I went back to work and and I asked if I can you know be back on the engine and, and get back to work and they were fine with it and they said you know anything you need you know, let us know and if something's bugging you you know just just let us know and, and we'll deal with it and uh, it was it was very nice because I wasn't sure how I was going to be accepted back with my coworkers and my my supervisors and, and the guys I work with every day. Um, so I got back to work and and uh, we I think we hit a fire like six hours after I got back to work and and I noticed that I wasn't as aggressive as I had always trained and that kind of bothered me for a minute and I, I think it was just something I had to not grow out of as much as I had to um, accept and understand that this was my, my opportunity to grow um, in this field and, and to better myself and, and to help not only myself, but the people I'm working around. You, you're nervous about coming, going back to another fire, but uh, I think the adrenaline was pumping so that night and we didn't want to leave everybody else. And, that's the reason why we stayed. I mean, I didn't want to leave it because we would have been leaving everybody else shorthanded. If I hadn't went back on the fire that night, I probably never would have. And that's the honest to goodness. If I hadn't went right straight back out there that night, I knew that everybody else was depending on me. And uh, there was still work to be done that night that needed to be done. And people were depending on me. And if I had not have gone back that night, I don't think I ever would have. The first big fire, it was kind of, I, I, I handled it good, but uh, I just kind of, I don't know, I seemed a little more like cautious. Like I was like uh, just looking at things and see fire and I get kind of apprehensive about things and look, but I wasn't letting it show or nothing. <laughs> but just kind of thinking like, man, this is the first fire I've been back to since I got burned over. It's just, but I've been to plenty of more since then, so I keep it in the back of my head, but I'll never forget it. But the, the best thing we did was the fact that we were back to work that next day, and that took your mind off it, and you, know, and you weren't getting benched, you weren't getting punished, and it would have given us more doubt that maybe we did do something wrong. If they are worried about our basically overall psyche and, and uh, physical well-being, a lot of departments would have pulled us off. But all 12 people said, hey, you know what, we want to go back to work. Uh, this is what we do. Uh, we were short resources on that fire as it was, and uh, that was the best thing we could have done is gone back to work. And yeah, there's things we definitely learned from it, but uh, that's been the best part is trying to, to turn it into a teaching tool and, and make it so that other people can learn from what we did right and what we did wrong. It's nice to be able to talk about it because you don't want to be sitting there wondering, you know, well, you know, is, is it weird that I felt this way or should I be feeling this way or that way, um, you know, and then I think everybody pretty much felt the same, 
you know, to where it wasn't a life or death situation, but there was a possibility that somebody could get hurt. And if we have the equipment there, you know, it kind of opens up this whole can of worms when you pull out the fire shelter, uh, you know, investigations and people second guessing your, your choices. But all things considered, that's minor compared to like an injury or a death as a result of not using the fire shelter. It was definitely the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. I can tell you that. You know, it's just an experience that I've gone through. I'm, I'm not gonna stop working because of it. I love the forest service, I love working. So I'm not gonna, uh, I got the apprenticeship afterwards. I'm planning on a long career. Uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of support there for me afterwards. Um, and understanding, I guess, that you're not the only one going through it. Uh, you know, I, I knew that the 10 of us were the only ones who went through this deployment but it, it, was, it was weeks before I realized that the dispatchers that I knew really well, the, you know, my bosses, my coworkers, they all went through the deployment with me I, in some form or another. Uh, they, were, they had something that was really weighing heavy on them from it too, uh, wondering how you know, one of their friends, one of their coworkers could get put in a situation like that. And, and, that it could happen to anyone and so once I kind of started realizing that and being able to talk with them I guess and I guess kind of share the story of up here and get to hear their stories and kind of be able to get the bigger picture I I guess that was kind of a big burden release I guess to, to be able to do that and and that helped and I I guess my final decision to stay was if if I can keep you know one person out of this particular situation or show one person what a good deployment site was, then it was probably worth sticking around to help share that knowledge because it's a, it's a knowledge you dang sure don't want to have to learn the hard way, but having learned it I, think it, I think it can help make you a better firefighter and fire manager on the ground.